Greetings, everyone. Gleecon here again with another episode of Lore of Warcraft. In our last episode, we covered the third chapter of our current novel, which is The Day of the Dragon. And in that chapter, um, the heroes were attacked by a dragon. Um, they were rescued by griffins and a little of their own ingenuity. Um, we have also seen Krasis trying to debate and gain uh, aid in, in helping free Alex Straza, which is basically the point of this entire novel. So stay a while and listen as we continue our journey in Chapter 4. The Paladins brought them back to a keep that had to have been the unnamed settlement of which Verisa had earlier spoken. Ronin was unimpressed by it. Its high stone walls surrounded a functional, unadorned establishment where the holy knights, squires, and a small population of common folk attempted to live in relative frugality. The banners of the Brotherhood flew side by side with those of the Lord Ron Alliance, of which the Knights of the Silver Hand were the most staunch supporters. If not for the townsfolk, Ronan would have taken the settlement for a completely military operation, for the rule of the Holy Order clearly had control over all matters here. The paladins had treated the elf with courtesy, some of the younger knights adding extra charm whenever Varisa spoke with them, but with the wizard, they would not traffic any more than necessity demanded, not even when at one point he asked how far they still had to go to reach Hasek. Varisa had to repeat the question in order for him to find out. Despite initial impressions, the pair were not, of course, prisoners, but Ronan certainly felt like an outcast among them. They treated him with minimal civility only because their oath to King Terranus demanded it of them, but otherwise he remained a pariah. We saw both the dragon and the griffins. Their leader, one Duncan Centaurus, boomed. Our duty and honor demanded we ride out immediately to see what aid we might be. The fact that the combat had been entirely aerial and therefore far out of their reach apparently had not dampened their holy enthusiasm, nor struck a chord with their common sense, Ronan thought wryly. They and the ranger made for good company in that. Curiously, though, the wizard felt a twinge of possessiveness now that he did not have to deal with Verisa on his own. After all, she was my appointed guide. She should remain true to her duty until Hasek. Unfortunately, as for Hasek, Duncan Centaurus had intentions for that, too. As they dismounted, the broad-shouldered senior knight offered his arm to the elf, saying, Of course, it would be remiss of us not to see you along the safest and quickest route to the port. I know it's a task you've been given, milady, but clearly it was chosen by a higher power that your paths would lead you to us. We know well the way to Hasek, and so a small party led by myself will journey with you come the morrow. This seemed to please the ranger, but hardly encouraged Ronan any. Everyone in the keep eyed him as if he had been transformed into a goblin or orc. He had suffered enough disdain around his fellow spellcasters and felt no need to have the paladins add further to his troubles. It's very kind of you, Ronan interjected from behind them, but Verisa is a capable ranger. We'll reach Hasek in time. Centaurus's nostrils flared as if he had just smelled something noxious. Keeping his smile fixed, the senior paladin said to the elf, Allow me to personally escort you to your quarters. He glanced at one of his subordinates. Merrick, find a place to put the wizard. This way, grumbled a hulking young knight with a full mustache. He looked ready to take Ronan by the arm, even if it meant breaking the limb in question. Ronan could have taught him the folly of doing that, but for the sake of his mission and peace between the various elements of the Alliance, he simply took a step forward, coming up beside his guide and not saying a word through the entire journey. He had expected to be led to the most dank, most foul place in which they could honestly let him bed down for the night, but instead, Ronan found himself with a room likely no more austere than those used by the dour warriors themselves. Dry, clean, and with stone walls that surrounded him on all sides save where the wooden door stood, it certainly served Ronan better than some of the places he had stayed in the past. A single neatly kept wooden bed and a tiny table made up the decor. A well-used oil lamp appeared to be the only means of illumination, not even the tiniest of windows evident. Ronan thought of at least requesting a window, but suspected the knights had nothing better to offer. Besides, this would better serve to keep curious eyes from him. This will do, he finally said, but the young warrior who had brought Ronan here had already begun to depart, closing the door as he left. The wizard tried to recall if the outside handle had a bolt or some sort of lock, but the paladins would surely not go that far. Damn soul Ronan might be to them, but he was still one of their allies. The thought of the mental discomfort that last put the knights through cheered him a bit. He had always found the knights of the Silver Hand a sanctimonious lot. 
His reluctant hosts left him alone until evening meal. He found himself seated far from Verisa, who seemed to have the commander's ear whether she wanted it or not. But one, no one but the elf spoke more than a few words to the wizard throughout the entire repast, and Ronan would have left shortly after that if the subject of dragons had not been brought up by none other than Centaurus. The flights have grown more common the last few weeks, the bearded knight informed them. More common and more desperate. The orcs know that their time is short, and so they seek to wreak what havoc they can before the day of their final judgment. He took a sip of wine. The settlement of Jeroon was set aflame by two dragons just three days ago, more than half its population dead in the ungodly incident. That time the beasts and their masters fled before the griffin riders could reach the site. Horrible, Theresa murmured. Duncan nodded, a glint of almost fanatical determination in his deep brown eyes. But soon a thing passed. Soon we shall march on the interior of Cosmo Don, on Grimbatol itself. That's what it was, Grimbatol, when I forgot a couple episodes ago. Not Barad Dor. Not Tolbarad, I mean. And end the threat of the last fragments of the Horde. Orc blood will flow. And good men will die, Ronan added under his breath. Apparently the commander had hearing as good as that of the elf, for his gaze immediately shifted to the mage. Good men will die, aye, but we have sworn to see Lordaeron and all other lands free of the orc menace, and so we shall, no matter what the cost. Unimpressed, the wizard returned, but first you need to do something about the dragons, don't you? They will be vanquished, spellcaster, sent to the underworld where they belong, if you're devilish kind. Theresa softly touched the commander's hand, giving him a smile that made even Ronan a bit jealous. How long have you been a paladin, Lord Centaurus? Ronan watched with some amazement as the ranger transformed into an enchanted and enchanting young woman, akin to those he had met in the royal court of Lordaeron. Her transformation in turn changed Duncan Centaurus. She teased and toyed with the graying knight, seeming to hang on his every word. Her per personality had altered so much that the observing wizard could scarce believe this was the same female who had ridden as his guide and his guard for the past several days. Duncan went into great detail about his not-so-humble, humble beginnings, as the son of a wealthy lord who chose the order to make his name. Although surely the other knights had heard the story before, they listened with rapt attention, no doubt seeing their leader as a shining example to their own careers. Ronan studied each briefly, noticing with some unease that these other paladins barely blinked barely even breathed as they drank in the tale. Theresa commented on various parts of his story, making even the most mundane accomplishments of the elder man seem wondrous and brave. She downplayed her own deeds when Lord Centaurus asked her of her past training, although the mage felt certain that in many skills, his ranger readily surpassed their host. The paladin seemed enamored by her act and went on at tremendous length, but Ronan finally had enough. He excused himself, an announcement that drew the attention of no one, and hurried outside, seeking air and solitude. Night had settled over the keep, a moonless dark that enveloped the tall wizard like a comforting blanket. He looked forward to reaching Hasek and setting forth on his voyage to Cosmodon. Only then would he be done with paladins, rangers, and other useless fools who did nothing but interfere with his true quest. Ronan worked best alone, a point he had tried to make before the last debacle, no one had listened to him then, and he had been forced to do what he had to in order to succeed. The others on that mission had not heeded his warnings, nor understood the necessity of his dangerous work. With the typical contempt of the non-talented, they had gone charging directly into the path of his grand spell, and thus most had perished along with the true targets, a band of orc warlocks intent on raising from the dead what some believed had been one of the demons of legend. Ronan regretted each and every one of those deaths more than he had ever let on to his masters in the Kirin Tor. They haunted him, urged him on to more risky feats. And what could be more risky than attempting all by himself to free the Dragon Queen from her captors? He had to do it all by himself, not only for the glory it would bring him, but also Ronan hoped to appease the spirits of his former comrades, spirits who never left him even a moment's rest. Even Krasis did not know about those troubling specters. Likely a good thing, as it might have made him question Ronan's sanity and worth. The wind picked up as he made his way to the top of the keep's surrounding wall. A few knights stood sentry duty, but word of his presence in the settlement had evidently traveled swiftly, and after the first guard identified him by way of inspection by lantern, Ronan once again became shunned. That suited him well. 
He cared as little for the warriors as they did for him. Beyond the keep, the vague shapes of trees turned the murky landscape into something magical. Ronan found himself half tempted to leave the questionable hospitality of his hosts and find a place to sleep under an oak. At least then he would not have to listen to the pious words of Duncans and tourists, who in the mage's mind seemed far more interested in Verisa than a knight of the Holy Order should have been. True, she had arresting eyes, and her garments suited her form well. Ronan snorted, eradicating the image of the ranger from his thoughts. His forced seclusion during his penance had clearly had more of an effect on him than he had realized. Magic was his mistress first and foremost, and if Ronan did decide to seek the company of a female, he much preferred a more malleable type, such as the well-pampered young ladies of the courts, or even the impressionable serving girls he found occasionally during his travels. Certainly not an arrogant elven ranger. Best to turn his attention to more important matters. Along with his unfortunate mount, Ronan had also lost the items Krasis had given him. He had to do his best to make contact with the other withered wizard, inform him as to what had happened. The young mage regretted the necessity of doing so, but he owed too much to Krasis to not try. By no means did Ronan consider turning back. That would have ended his hopes of ever regaining face not only among his peers, but also with himself. He surveyed his present surroundings. Eyes that saw slightly better than average in the night detected no sentries in the near vicinity. A watchtower wall shielded him from the sight of the last man he had passed. What better place than here to begin? His room might have served too, but Ronan favored the open, the better to clear the cobwebs from his thoughts. From a pocket deep within his robe, he removed a small dark crystal. Not the best choice for trying to create communication across miles, but the only one left to him. Ronan held the crystal up to the brightest of the faint stars overhead and began to mutter words of power. A faint glimmer arose within the heart of the stone, a glimmer that increased slowly in intensity as he continued to speak. The mystical words rolled from his tongue, and at that moment the stars abruptly vanished. Cutting off the spell in mid-sentence, Ronan stared. No, the stars he had fixed on had not vanished. He could see them now, yet and for a brief moment, no more than the blink of an eye, the mage could have sworn. A trick of the imagination in his own weariness. Considering the trials of the day, Ronan should have gone to bed immediately after dining, but he had first wanted to attempt this spell. The sooner he finished them, the better. He wanted to be fully rejuvenated come the morrow, for Lord Centaurus would certainly set an arduous pace. Once more Ronan raised the crystal high, and once more he began muttering the words of power. This time, no trick of the eye d would... What do you do there, spellcaster? A deep voice demanded. Ronan swore furious at this second delay. He turned to the knight who had come across him and snapped, Nothing to- An explosion rocked the wall. The crystal slipped from Ronan's hand. He had no time to reach for it, more concerned with keeping himself from tumbling over the wall to his death. The sentry had no such hope. As the wall shook, he fell backward, first collapsing against the battlements, then toppling over. His cry shook Ronan until its very abrupt end. The explosion subsided, but not the damage caused by it. No sooner had the desperate wizard regained his footing when a portion of the wall itself began to collapse inward. Ronan leapt toward the watchtower, thinking it more secure. He landed near the doorway and started inside, just as the tower itself began to teeter dangerously. Ronan tried to exit, but the doorway crumbled, trapping him within. He started a spell, certain that it was already too late. The ceiling fell upon him. And with it came something akin to a gigantic hand that seized the wither wizard in such a smothering grip, Ronan completely lost his breath and all consciousness. Necro's skull crusher brooded over the fate that the bones had rolled for him long, long ago. The grizzled orc toyed with one yellowed tusk as he studied the golden disc in the meaty palm of his other hand, wondering how one who had learned to wield such power could have been sentenced to play nursemaid and jailer to a brooding female whose only purpose was to produce progeny after progeny. Of course, the fact that she was the greatest of dragons might have had something to do with that role, that and the fact that with what but one good leg Necros could never hope to achieve and hold on to the role of clan chieftain. The golden disc seemed to mock him. It always seemed to mock him, but the crippled orc never once considered throwing it away. With it, he had achieved a position that still kept him respected among his fellow warriors, even if he had lost all respect for himself the day the human knight had hacked off the bottom half of his left leg. 
Necros had slain the human, but could not bring himself to do the honorable thing. Instead, he had let the others drag him from the field, cauterize the wound, and help build for Necros the support he needed for his maimed appendage. His eyes flickered to what remained of the knee and the wooden peg attached there. No more glorious combat, no more legacy of blood and death. Other warriors had slain themselves for less grievous injuries, but Necros could not. The very thought of bringing the blade to his own throat or chest filled him with a chill he dared not mention to any of the others. Necro's skull crusher very much wanted to live, no matter what the cost. There were those in Dragonmaw clan who might have already sent him on his way to the glorious battlefields of the afterlife if not for his skills as a warlock. Early on, his talent for the arts had been noticed, and he had received training from some of the greatest. However, the way of the warlock had demanded from him other choices that Necros had not wanted to make. Dark choices that, he felt, did not serve the Horde, but rather worked to undermine it. He had fled their ranks, returned to his warrior ways, but from time to time his chieftain, the great shaman Zulahed, had demanded the use of his other talents, especially in what even most orcs had believed impossible, the capturing of the Dragon Queen Alexstrasza. <clears throat> Zulahed wielded the ritualistic magics of the ancient shaman belief as few had done since first the Horde had been formed, but for his task he also needed to call upon the more sinister powers in which Necros had been trained. Through resources, the wizened orc had never revealed his crippled companion. Zulahed had uncovered an ancient talisman said to be capable of tremendous wonders. The only trouble had been that it had not responded to sh shamanistic spellwork no matter how great the effort put in by the chieftain. That had led Zulahed to turn to the only warlock he felt he could trust, a warrior loyal to Dragonmaw clan. And so Necros had inherited the demon soul. Zulahed had so named the featureless gold disc, although at first the other orc had not known why. Necros turned it over and over, not for the first time marveling at its impressive yet simplistic appearance. Pure gold, yes, and shaped like a huge coin with a rounded edge. It gleamed in even the lowest light, and nothing could tarnish its look. Oil, mud, blood, everything slipped off. This is older than either shaman or warlock magic, Necros, Zulahed had told him. I can do nothing with it. But perhaps you can. Trained though he was, the peg-legged orc had doubted that he, who had sworn off the dark arts, could do better than his legendary chieftain. Still, he had taken the talisman and tried to sense its purpose, its use. Two days later, thanks to his astonishing success and Zulahed's firm guidance, they had done what no one would have imagined possible, especially the Dragon Queen herself. Necros grunted, slowly raising himself to a standing position. His leg ached where the knee met the peg, an ache intensified by the great girth of the orc. Necros had no illusions about his ability to lead. He could scarcely get around the cave as it was. Time to visit her highness. Make certain that she knew she had a schedule to maintain. Zulahed and the few other clan leaders left free still had dreams of revitalizing the Horde, stirring those abandoned by the weakling Doomhammer into a revolt. Necros doubted these dreams, but he was a loyal orc, and as a loyal orc he would obey his chieftain's commands to the letter. The demon soul clutched in one hand, the orc trundled through the dank cavern corridors. Dragonmaw clan had worked hard to lengthen the system already running through these mountains. The complex series of corridors enabled the orcs to deal more readily with the burdensome task of raising and training dragons for the glory of the horde. Dragons filled up a lot of space and so needed separate facilities, each of which had to be dug out. Of course, there were fewer dragons these days, a point Zulahed and others had made with Necros quite often lately. They needed dragons if their desperate campaign had any hope of succeeding. Not am I supposed to make a breed faster? Necros grunted to himself. A pair of younger massive warriors strode by. Nearly seven feet tall, each as wide as two of their human adversaries, the tusked fighters dipped their heads briefly in recognition of his rank. Huge battle axes hung from harnesses on their backs. Both were dragon riders, new ones. Riders had a death ratio about twice that of their mounts, generally due to an unfortunate loss of grip. There had been times when Necros had wondered whether the clan would run out of able warriors before it ran out of dragons, but he never broached the subject with Zulahed. Hobbling along, the aging orc soon began to hear the telltale signs of the Dragon Queen's presence. He noted labored breathing that echoed through the immediate area as if some steam vent from the depths of the earth had worked its way up. Necros knew what labored breathing meant. He had arrived just in time. No guards stood at the carved-out entrance to the dragon's great chamber, but still Necros paused. Attempts had been made in the past to free or slay the gargantuan red dragon within, but all those attempts had ended in grisly death. 
Not from the dragon, of course, for she would have embraced such assassins with relief, but rather from an, an unexpected aspect of the talisman Necros held. <clears throat> the orc squinted at what seemed nothing but an open passage. Come! Instantly, the very air around the entrance flared. Tiny balls of flame burst into being, then immediately merged. A humanoid form began to fill, then overflow the entrance. Something vaguely resembling a burning skull formed where the head should have been. Armor that appeared to be flaming bone shaped itself into the body of a monstrous warrior that dwarfed even the enormous orcs. Necros felt no heat from the hellish flames, but he knew that if the creature before him touched the orc even lightly, pain such as even a seasoned fighter could not imagine would rake him. Among the other orcs, it had been whispered that Necro's skull crusher had summoned one of the demons of lore. He did not discourage that r rumor, although Zulahed knew better. The monstrous creature guarding the dragon had no sense of independent thought. In attempting to harness the abilities of the mysterious artifact, Necros had unleashed something else. Zulahed called it a golem of fire, perhaps of the essence of demon power, but certainly not one of the supposedly mythical beings. Whatever its origins or its previous use, the golem served as the perfect sentry. Even the fiercest warrior steered clear of it. Only Necros could command it. Zulahed had tried, but the artifact from which the golem had emerged seemed now tied to the one-legged orc. I enter, he told the fiery creature. The golem stiffened, then shattered in a wild shower of dying sparks. Despite having witnessed its departure time and time again, Necros still backed up son, not daring to move forward until the last of the sparks had faded away. The moment the orc stepped inside, a voice remarked, I knew you would be here soon. The disdain with which the shackled dragon spoke affected her jailer not in the least. He had heard far worse from her over the years. Clutching the artifact, he made his way toward her head, which, by necessity, had been clamped down. They had lost one handler to her mighty jaws. They would not lose another. <clears throat> by rights, the iron chains and clamps should not have been sufficient to hold such a magnificent leviathan, but they had been enhanced by the power of the disc. Struggle all she might, Alexstrasza would never be able to free herself. That, of course, did not mean that she did not try. Do you need anything? Necros did not ask out of any concern for her. He only wanted to keep her alive for the Horde's desires. Once the crimson dragon's scales had gleamed like metal, she still filled the vast cavern tail to head, yet these days her rib bones showed slightly underneath the skin, and her words came out more beleaguered. Despite her dire condition, though, the hatred in those vast golden eyes had not faded. When the orc knew that if the Dragon Queen ever did escape, he would be the first one down her gullet or fried to a crisp. Of course, since the odds of that were so very minor, even one-legged Necros did not worry. Death would be nice, he grunted, turning away from this useless conversation. At one point during her lengthy incarceration, she had tried to starve herself, but the simple tactic of taking her next clutch of eggs and breaking one of them before her horrified eyes had been enough to end that threat. Despite knowing that each hatchling would be trained to terrorize the Horde's enemies and likely die because of that, Alexstrasza clearly held out hope that someday they would be free. Shattering the egg had been like shattering a part of that hope, one less dragon with the potential to be his own master. As he always did, Necros inspected her latest clutch. Five eggs this time. A fair number, but most were a bit smaller than usual. That bothered him. This chieftain had already remarked on the runts produced in the last batch, although even a runt of a dragon stood several times higher than an orc. Dropping the disc into a secure pouch at his waist, Necros bent to lift up one of the eggs. The loss of his leg had not yet weakened his arms, and so the massive orc had little trouble hefting the object in question. A good weight, he noted. If the other eggs were this heavy, then at least they would produce healthy young. Best to get them down to the incubator chamber as soon as possible. The volcanic heat there would keep them at just the right temperature for hatching. As Necros lowered the egg, the dragon muttered, this is all useless, mortal. Your little war is all but over. You may be right, he grunted, no doubt surprising her with his candor. The grizzled orc turned back to his gargantuan captive. But we'll fight to the end, lizard. Then you shall do so without us. My last consort is dying. You know that. Without him, there will be no more eggs. Her voice, already low, became barely audible. The Dragon Queen exhaled with effort as if the conversation had taxed her already weakening strength too much. He squinted at her, studying those reptilian orbs. 
Necros knew that Alexstrasza's last consort was indeed dying. They started out with three, but one had perished while trying to escape over the sea, and another had died of injuries when the rogue dragon Deathwing had caught him by surprise. The third, the eldest of the lot, had remained by his queen's side, but he had been centuries older than even Alexstrasza, and now those centuries, coupled with past near-mortal injuries, had taken their toll. We'll find another, then, she managed to snort. Her words barely came out as a whisper. And how would you go about doing that? We'll find one. He had no other answer for her, but Necros would be damned if he would give the lizard that satisfaction. Frustration and anger, long held in, began to boil over. He hobbled toward her. And as for you, lizard... Necros had dared come within a few yards of the Dragon Queen's head, aware that thanks to the enchanted bond she would be unable to flame or eat him. Thus it was to his tremendous dismay that suddenly Alexstrasza's head, brace and all, suddenly twisted toward him, filling his gaze. The dragon's maw opened wide, and the orc had the distinctive displeasure of gazing deep into the gullet of the creature who was about to make a snack of him. Or would have, if not for Necros's quick reaction. Clutching the pouch in which he carried the demon soul, the warlock muttered a single word, thought a single command. A pained roar shook the chamber, sending chunks of rock falling from the ceiling. The crimson behemoth pulled back her head as best she could. The brace around her throat glowed with such power that the orc had to shield his eyes. Near him, the fiery servant of the disc materialized in a flash, dark eye sockets looking to Necros for command. The warlock, however, had no need for the creature, the artifact itself having dealt with the nearly disastrous situation. Leave, he commanded the fire golem. <clears throat> As the creature departed in an explosive display, the crippled orc dared walk before the dragon. A scowl spread across his ugly features, and the frustration of knowing that he served a, loss, a cause lost urged Necros to greater anger at the leviathan's latest attempt on his life. Still full of tricks, eh, lizard? He glared at the brace, which Alexstrasza had clearly worked long to loosen from the wall. The enchantment affecting her bonds did not extend to the stone upon which they were fastened, Necros realized. That mistake had nearly cost him. But failing to achieve his death would now cost her. Necros fixed his heavily browed gaze on the now truly injured dragon. A daring trick, he snarled. A daring trick, but a foolish one. He held up the golden disc for her widening eyes to see. Zula had commanded I keep you as healthy as possible, but my chieftain also commanded me to punish whenever I thought necessary. Necros tightened his grip on the artifact, which now glowed, which now glowed bright. Now is. Excuse this pitiful one's interruption, O oh gracious master, came a jarring voice from within the cavern. But words come, you must hear. Oh, you must. Necros nearly dropped the artifact. Whirling about as best he could with one good leg, the huge orc stared down at a pitifully tiny creature with bat-like ears and a vast set of sharp teeth set in a mad grin. Necros did not know what bothered him more, the creature himself, or the fact that the goblin had somehow managed to infiltrate the dragon's cavern without being stopped by the golem. You! How'd you get in here? Reaching down, he grasped the tiny form by the throat and lifted him upward. All thought of punishing the dragon vanished. How? Even though he spoke words half-choked, the foul little creature still smiled. He just walked in, oh gracious master. Just walked in. Necros considered. The goblin must have entered when the fire golem had come to its master's aid. Goblins were tricky and often found their way into places thought secure, but even this clever rogue could not have worked this, his way inside otherwise. He let the beast drop to the ground. All right, why come? What news do you bring? The goblet rubbed his throat. Only the most important, only the most important, I assure you. The toothy smile broadened. Have I ever let you down, wondrous master? Despite the fact that deep down Necros felt that goblins had less of a sense of honor than a ground slug, the orc had to admit that this one had never steered him wrong. Questionable allies at best, the goblins played many games of their own, but always fulfilled the mission set upon them by Doomhammer, and before him the great Black Hand. Speak then, and be quick about it. The devilish imp nodded several times. Yes, Necros, yes. I come to tell you there's a plan underway. More than one, actually, to free. He hesitated and cocked his head toward weary Alexstrasza. That is to cause great disaster to Dragonmore Plan's dreams. An uncomfortable sensation coursed down the orc's spine. What do you mean? 
Again, the goblin cocked his head toward the dragon. That's somewhere elsewhere, gracious master. The creature had the right of it. Necros glanced at his captive, who appeared to be unconscious from pain and exhaustion. Still better to be wary around her for now. If his spy brought him the news he suspected, the orc warlock hardly wanted the dragon queen to hear the details. Very well, he grunted. Necros hobbled toward the cavern entrance, already mulling over the likely news. The goblin hopped beside him, grinning from ear to ear. Necros felt tempted to wipe that annoying smile off the other's face, but needed the creature for now. Still for the slightest excuse. This better be good, Krill. You understand? Krill nodded as he hurried to keep up, his head bobbing up and down like a broken toy. Trust me, Master Necros. Just trust me. All right, so we got Krill as a double agent. He's also working for Deathwing. Um, we have something that's racked the camp, maybe a dragon attack, where the Ronin and... Uh, keep forgetting her name. Um, Verisa or Stang. And we see the plight of Alex Straza. All right, we got this episode in the pipe five by five. I thank everybody so much for listening. And I look forward to seeing you next time on Lore of Warcraft.